now for the speech of our chief guest, Ms. Ingrid Sinath. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Professor Chakraborty. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. Thank you very much, uh, Shri Kulkarni. Um, I actually feel like I don't need to add very much. I feel like between Professor Bhattacharya and Shri Kulkarni, they've covered all the ground that I needed to cover. Uh, so I could save you a good 20 minutes and we could uh, move on to tea or whatever it is that you have planned. But let me pick up really on the themes that they have already laid out. Let me start with this theme that Professor Bhattacharya left us with, which is this notion of magical transformation. Uh, there are moments in our life that are transformative. You know, I don't know how many of you are fans of Harry Potter, but when Harry Potter boards that train, the Hogwarts Express, he crosses a threshold which totally alters his life's trajectory. It was 37 years ago that I boarded my train, the Gitanjali Express, at what was then still called Bombay Central Station for a journey that was over 30 hours uh, across the subcontinent in the opposite direction from Sri Kulkarni's tra travels. I went from Bombay Central to Hara Central. Uh, and I fell in love with Kolkata the minute I saw that cobbled strand road where I was boarding the Barosi bus to come to Joka. I had very little idea what lay ahead of me, but I did have the sense of an exhilarating new beginning. I feel uh, sorry for that, that you uh, don't yet have the experience of first of all, bidding your family that fond farewell, and then that nervous excitement of the long journey to sort of immerse yourself in the surroundings at Joka that are truly uh, breathtaking, uh, but also of coming face to face with this crowd of strangers that you see on the screen, among whom you will find uh, definitely, I can assure you, some of your closest lifelong friends. But nonetheless, despite the fact that you have not made that physical transition, you have crossed a threshold and you have commenced on a journey that will likely be one of the most consequential journeys of your life. As others have said today, you will of course learn a lot. I mean, that goes without saying. You will learn new disciplines and concepts and tools and frameworks and ways of thinking that will shape how you see the world and how you see yourself. You will definitely be tested. You will have, first of all, I think your assumptions about yourself and about others challenged. You will definitely have moments when your self-esteem will take a knock. There will be moments of utter elation and moments of pure heartbreak, moments of great triumph and moments that feel like the end of the world. I hope when campus life and travel become possible that you will also experience Joker, but not just Joker, but the many fascinations of Kolkata and other nearby places, all of which offer untold delights in food, in history, in culture, in natural beauty. But most of all, what you have to look forward to is the opportunity to reimagine yourself, to transcend what Tagore called the narrow domestic walls. In this case of academic specialization, of, geograph of geography, of family circumstances, you have today gained access to, as you have already been told, a very elite club. It's a club that exercises disproportionate influence over the lives of others in India and around the world. Where too many of our citizens are toiling in basements, you are today taking an escalator to the penthouse. If not quite the penthouse, at least to a very high floor with a fantastic panoramic view. What is the question? that you, what are you gonna do with this privilege that you have been gifted? Many years ago, I read an essay called, Who Actually Paid For My Education? by a gentleman called Atanu De. His argument in the essay is that if you are born into what we so euphemistically call the middle class in India, you are raised to believe that everything you have and everything you are is the result of your own effort and the hard work of your parents and their parents, what we often refer to as merit. You have likely gone to decent schools and colleges, which 
whether they call themselves private or convent, Kendriya Vidyalaya or public, are all actually beneficiaries of huge subsidies. The price, in a sense, of this escalator that you and I have taken is paid by the millions of people in our generation who never have the opportunity to acquire even a decent level of literacy. And we have this privilege mostly by sheer accident of birth. There is a young rural tribal Dalit or Muslim woman who has paid the price of our privilege. These positively indecent schisms in our society are now widening at an alarming rate. And they have been made utterly visible. They have been laid bare by COVID-19. For many so-called middle-class Indians, this pandemic first forced us to confront the deep inequalities that surround us. And then more recently has given us firsthand experience of the horror of our public systems and the indignities faced every day by those who cannot buy their way out of those systems. It's also shone a spotlight on the roles played by our nonprofit sector, by citizen groups, by philanthropies, and by NGOs. In many cases, these were organizations that provided the only real support that many received. The sector responded wherever it saw need, with food, with transport, with livelihood support, with oxygen, with helping people get access to hospitals and medicines, but also by advocating for those who were ignored and who have limited voice in our systems. For 23 years, I've had the privilege of working alongside some of these individuals and organizations. And I can assure you in these last 15 months, the courage, the innovation and the sheer selflessness I have witnessed has completely taken my breath away. So how did I get here? How did I make what is being called this unconventional choice? Uh, clearly a career in the social sector is not the obvious choice for most business school graduates. And my own journey here, I often say, is a consequence of a combination of boredom and megalomania. A decade after I left Joker, when I was still in the private sector, I found myself really struggling with the question of impact. What mark would I leave on the world? It seemed to me that, you know, a new designation on my visiting card, a slightly bigger business to run, maybe a new model car, helping a few shareholders get wealthier. It just didn't seem to me like goals that provided me with the sense of purpose or the motivation even to do my best. I was very fortunate at that time to find in Cry, Child Rights and You, an NGO which actually had some use for the skills that I could offer. And as the sector has evolved, one of the big changes we are observing is that the range of skill sets that it now demands are much wider. Uh, it's everything from marketing, finance, legal, HR, data science, information technology, you name it, there is now a role for that skill set in the social sector. I was lucky enough to spend a decade at CRY where I got to completely re-architect the marketing, the fundraising, the technology and the governance systems at that organization. I introduced some very nasty business practices like outsourcing and downsizing. Um, and in the process managed the transition of that organization from a charitable service delivery organization to a rights-based advocacy organization. But it took, the learning curve was sharp. It took me quite a while to unlearn so many of the beliefs that I brought with me from the business world. And of course, the hubris that many MBAs carry. I'll give you an example. I was traveling once in Manipur. And the purpose of the trip was to try and convince families of the need to mobilize for their children's right to education. At one such meeting, one such community meeting, I encountered a woman called Bimala. Bimala asked me a straightforward question. She said that she had lost her husband to AIDS. She and two of her children were HIV positive. Can you help me save the life of at least one of my remaining children? She literally shouted at me. And she said, if you can't, then stop wasting my time. 
HIV AIDS prevention was not a part of CRI's agenda at that time, and we were mainly focused on education. But I decided to dig a little deeper into this problem. And what we found was that the entire AIDS control program in our country had been designed with the very best intentions to prioritize those groups who represented the highest likelihood of transmission. So groups like intravenous drug users, commercial sex workers, LGBTQ communities, etc., could get free testing and free treatment. Children, because they represented practically zero transmission risk, had been completely excluded from testing and treatment. Values from the world of business, efficiency, productivity, and those kinds of values had triumphed over humanitarian values of justice and equity and inclusion. Another lesson that it took me a long while to learn was that knowledge and expertise are not sufficient to earn the license to make change happen. The communities and the NGOs that serve them have been disappointed and betrayed so many times by experts who swoop down like seagulls, ruffle everyone's feathers, and then fly away with the data that informs their research papers and models, leaving the communities to clear up the mess that they have left behind. We are witnessing it right now. Communities are resisting testing and vaccination because of their deep distrust of the systems that have excluded and exploited them for generations. Building trust and co-creating solutions with them is what earns us the right to work alongside them, not our superior education or the degrees we hold or the expertise that we have garnered. Learning that and learning the humility to not presume that we have all the answers was a very long and difficult transition for me perhaps because I'm a slow learner. And it's one that many business people and government agencies are still learning. The 23 years that I've spent in the social sector have been just immensely rewarding personally. I mean, my work at CRI and subsequently with international organizations like Civicus and Hivos has taken me from tiny tribal hamlets in the far Northeast and in Jharkhand and in Chhattisgarh Dalit hamlets in Kanyakumari, all the way to the most exotic locations around the world. And more importantly, brought me in touch with the incredible leaders that exist at every stratum of our society, from the grassroots movements where really the most effective change makers live, to the most rarefied halls of the United Nations and the World Bank and the World Economic Forum, where the levers of power and our financial resources are controlled. I often wonder whether my peers, my fellow a cohort of um, batchmates who perhaps make the same journeys traveling first class rather than economy and probably live in much nicer hotels, um, maybe even one or two aspiring to have a private jet or a yacht now. Uh, I wonder whether they enjoy what they do uh, and they enjoy these benefits as much as I do my work. How do their feelings, I wonder, compare with seeing a young girl's eyes light up when she realizes that she doesn't have to limit herself to the life that she has seen her mother live? Or when, as some have mentioned before, see when you see your efforts result in a constitutional amendment that makes education a fundamental right or when you are find yourself at a table exchanging experiences with heroes of the struggle against apartheid or heroes of the Arab Spring or with Nobel Prize winners, or when you witness the complete joy of a family being reunited with a human rights defender who has just been released from prison. So must you all aspire to change the world? Here's what I think. The crossroads at which we currently stand are a defining moment for our country, for our species, and for our planet. And it must sometimes seem like a terrible injustice to you in your generation that you have been landed with all these converging crises. But they're not just crises, they are also a gift. I was speaking recently to an activist friend 
and I asked him how he was coping with this relentless onslaught of challenges of, you know, decades of hard-won progress in development being washed away before our eyes, combating daily attacks on our democratic freedoms, struggling to meet the demands of the communities that he serves while spending sleepless nights wondering whether donors are going to come through with their commitments that will allow him to keep his organization and his staff employed. And his answer took me aback and it was quite simple. He pointed out to me that our grandparents' generation, this is probably your great grandparents, experienced the accomplishments of the freedom struggle and the decades of nation building that followed. In our parents' generation, they got to take on the emergency and help to restore democracy. This crisis or the confluence of crises that we face is our once in a lifetime opportunity to leave a mark on history for our generation. And regardless of what particular path you choose after you leave IMC, you will face a world which is more open to change than it has been for decades. Whether you choose to apply your skills in business or in government, in media or in civil society, you will have an unprecedented opportunity to shape and fundamentally redesign the social contract that shapes our society. This balance between Sarkar and Bazaar and Samaj that many talk about. It has never been more clear, I think, than that the system is broken or rather it's not broken, it's fixed. To benefit the few at the cost of the many, to privatize profits by socializing losses and to trade short-term gains for irreversible harm to future generations and our planet. From the basic tenets of capitalism to the role of the state in development, from the very purpose of business to the ways in which citizens are going to exercise their rights in this radical new public sphere, all of it is up for reinvention. It's like a jigsaw where all the pieces are in play and you get to decide how you want to assemble them. The ways we deliver healthcare, for example, or education, or livelihoods, or housing, or energy, or transportation, or urban development, or social protection, all of these systems and markets are demanding urgent redesign. And so also are systems of governance, which are permitting a few of us to exercise disproportionate influence on our electoral, legislative, judicial, and law enforcement processes. Few people will be better placed than you to make those changes happen. You will leave IMC with that magical key card that grants you access to the most powerful institutions in the world, whether they be banks or consultancies, industrial conglomerates or tech unicorns, social media giants or the institutions of bureaucratic and political power, influential media houses, and the most innovative social enterprises. You will have a seat at the tables where weighty decisions are made, decisions that influence the lives of millions of consumers, of employees, of investors and voters. You will most importantly have the language and the tools that endow you with that legitimacy and credibility that was mentioned that will allow you to be heard and taken seriously. So if I can offer advice, and really I don't know whether I, I have the legitimacy to do that, but if I can, it's make the most of your time at IMC. Grab with both hands all the knowledge, all the experiences, all the challenges that cross your path in the classroom and beyond. Take the time to savor the sights and sounds, the tastes and smells, the music and the laughter as you connect with your fellow students, with your faculty and your staff online and as soon as it becomes feasible offline. The worst choice you can make right now is to believe you already know it all or to believe that to be successful, you must pretend to know it all or to believe that you should game the system to succeed when you have not earned success, or even to believe that you know now what your future career choices will be. It will be in your admission of ignorance, in your willingness to risk failure, 
in your openness to having your deepest convictions challenged and in your doubts and uncertainties that you will find the greatest learning and the greatest rewards. When I was at Joka, we did not know at the time, but we were fortunate to be there at a time before internet access, before mobile phones, before even personal computers. Yes, I know it is hard for you to imagine, but there really was such a time. It meant that we had almost no choice but to spend time with each other, exploring the library, the surroundings, and inventing our own entertainment often. So even a hardcore introvert like me ended up perforce discovering the diverse life experiences of my fellow students and widening my horizons. In your generation, you will have to work harder to see people beyond their grades and their social media posts. But in a time when very few things are certain, this you can count on, that the friendships you form here will last you a lifetime. Academically, my advice is pick the courses where you stand to learn the most, not the subjects you know you are already great at. Lives at IMC have been profoundly altered by engineers being exposed to the humanities and literature graduates discovering calculus. One of my lasting regrets is that I didn't do enough finance electives. Above all, however, have fun. You are unlikely to ever again have this much freedom to try new things without fear of failure, to explore new interests and to discover new facets of yourself. The world into which you will embark after IMC requires creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, and the ability to broker consensus. Skills that are portable across industries, countries, and sectors. These skills are going to be much more important, already are in fact much more important than the ability to crack the system to deliver good grades. One thing for sure that I have learned in these 37 years since I left Joker, sorry, 35 years since I left Joker, is that wealth, fame, and power, when they are legitimately earned, mm -hmm. are only byproducts mm -hmm. of making a difference in the lives of people. They come from finding a problem worth solving and then devising and delivering a solution that benefits the greatest number. But the greatest success goes to those people who dream, who help other people dream impossible dreams and help other people fulfill those dreams. This is as true as it was for Mahatma Gandhi as it is for Elon Musk. But regardless of which path you choose, let me wish you a thoroughly enjoyable time at IMC and wish that you dream ever bigger dreams for yourself and for humanity. Thank you.